This project began devoid entirely of any and all direction. All I knew is that I wanted a nice comfy robe to wear around the workroom, and that I wanted it to be as unnecessarily dramatic as physically possible. I looked initially to the concept of the Victorian tea gown, a definitively house garment meant to be worn as undress, but which was still considered nice enough to receive visitors in. But as I began playing around with the design and working on the style lines for the pattern, I ended up deciding to take a bit more inspiration from medieval dress cutting, incorporating lots of slim panels for a fitted bodice that flared out at the skirt for an extremely full hem. This wasn't wholly deviant from the original Victorian tea gown inspiration, since there was definitely a romanticization of medieval aesthetics, especially in this late Victorian period of dress. However, this particular garment ultimately is not a historical reconstruction. Let us simply explore what happens when you pluck out various elements of historical styles and techniques and apply them to a definitively 21st century project. Once I've got my pattern shapes roughly worked out, I'm transferring the muslin shapes to paper so that I have a proper pattern from which to put together a mock-up. These are going to be fully continuous dress panels, but I've only draped the bodice portion of each panel, since the skirt flare will firstly be much easier to work out on paper, and secondly, would involve lots of muslin consumption, which would have been a little bit pointless. So I'm presently trying to work out how much skirt flare to put into this skirt because we could do a little bit of skirt flare and have it not be so full or we could do a lot of skirt flare and have it be very very full. I was trying to figure out what my hem circumference ideally should be and therefore how much to break that down into each of these five, well ten, when you double them for a full garment panels. I don't think I want the front panel here to be quite 20 inches wide. If you can see, this would be the width of the front panel, which I think is quite wide if you can see it. Basically it goes from there and it would flare all the way out to the end of that meter stick, which I think is a little bit too much for the front. So what I ended up doing is sort of marking out my plan here, but I cut down the front panel to 12 inches, which is just on paper what sort of felt right to me. Um, which means I will redistribute the, the remaining 8 inches per side, of course. I put 4 inches additionally for the back panel because the back panel can be nice and swishy and full. And then I divided up the remaining 4 to 2 and 2 for the side back and the side. So it looks like we're going to be graduating from 12 to 20, 22, 22, 24. I, this could be incorrect, but this is the beauty of making a mock-up. We shall see if this works. Right, it is fitting time. Here is where we are so far. I know it doesn't look a whole lot like much, but we have the beginnings of a robe here. Um, so I have made actually a very common mistake when drafting this, in that I drafted the lines directly on my dress form, saying, okay, here's where my seam lines are, here is how this is going to be shaped and how this is going to work. I translated those shapes directly to my pattern with no ease. So this is effectively a very skin tight garment right now because I have drafted it to fit very conformingly to the shape of the form of the mannequin, um, which is not how I want the actual finished robe to fit. I would like this to be a more loose, less fitted garment. So I'm gonna have to add some ease to this and what I'm probably going to do is First of all, I would like to add probably about a half an inch to the front, just so that it's a bit closer in the front here. But I probably also will add maybe like just a very tiny amount, like a sixteenth of an inch to each seam. Other than that, you know, I'm quite happy with the general shape of this and with the shape of how the neck is doing and where the shoulders are. I think all of this should be okay-ish. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and make those couple of little adjustments to the side bodice pieces of this pattern, and then we will go ahead and start cutting this out of fabric. 
If you watched the Game of Thrones slash fantasy costume analysis video, then you probably have heard me talk about this in concept, but here it is in practice, in the fact that these dresses that are made up of essentially wide, or at least many panels that just get very wide at the hem like this, these are actually sort of secret, or at least historically, sort of secretly very ostentatious displays of wealth, purely in the fact that you need to use a certain length of material to accommodate the length of the garment, but that you can't necessarily make the most efficient use of the width, because I need the same amount of width to accommodate this hem down here as I do, of course, with the bodice up here. And with some fabrics that are non-directional, you can sort of top and tail them and sort of turn the next piece upside down and get another piece out of there. However, you can't do that with velvets because they're directional. You know how when you run your hand along velvet, it feels smooth in one direction and rough in another. I'm cutting it with the rough direction up, I suppose, so that when the fabric is held vertically, the fibers are standing sort of up. That way when the light hits it, the light gets trapped inside the fibers. The fibers don't reflect the light and create shine. Effectively what that does is makes the garment appear darker, richer, to, as opposed to the much shinier and brighter color that you would get from putting it the opposite direction. Either direction is fine, but you do sort of have to make a decision which one you're working with, because if you top and tail them that way, your pieces are going to be sort of randomly entirely different colors from one to the next. So I um, have been having to cut all of my pieces this way, which means that all of this is just wasted. And I have got the sleeves cut out of one of these spaces and I have got pockets cut out of the other, but there's still not an ideal amount of fabric being used on this. In fact, I am a bit short. I ordered four yards of this fabric, which unfortunately I have to order another full two yards to again accommodate the length of this. All that being said, the very historically accurate way to sort of cheat this a little bit, because again, if you're a little short in width in one place, you don't really want to have to buy a whole extra two yards or meters or L's or whatever you're working with of fabric. Instead, what they would do is what I'm about to do here, and they would just put a piecing on. So I folded my pattern back here just like this, I will draw the seam line here, cut it out with some seam allowance, and then I will go in and cut a separate piece that is this, again with full seam allowance, stitch them on to form the full panels. We like to use the phrase piecing as period because this is done absolutely all over the place in historical garments, even on the fanciest of court dresses, down the center front of these dresses. Piecing was absolutely a thing that was done anywhere and everywhere without shame. This is a perfectly valid way to work, historically as well as today. So I've decided that I'm going to interline the bodice pieces of these robe panels with a bit of horsehair interlining. This is a practice generally used in tailoring, and this will just help to give the bodice area a nice, smooth, structured look to it. Horsehair is a really interesting material because the warp grain, which is the one that goes straight up and down along the selvage, is just generally a linen fiber, usually a plant fiber. It can be whatever, but usually it's linen. The weft fiber, however, the one that goes uh, along the cross grain, this is generally horsehair, and horsehair, uh, hence the name horsehair canvas, horsehair is a very springy material. So as you can see, if you fold horsehair fabric vertically along the linen thread, it folds up like normal fabric would, but if you try and fold it horizontally along the horsehair, it's a bit springier, and it wants to sort of keep itself out in shape. That is what the horsehair does. And because the body is a round thing, it, this really helps to keep a nice rounded smooth shape as the garment goes around the body, helps it not to collapse in on itself, which makes for a really nice, smooth, clean, crisp bodice bit. I'm, I'm cutting out a set of these bodice panel pieces out of this horsehair interlining, and I'm only going down to the waist because I, don't, I won't need as much of that. There's no need to add bulk down at the skirt area of these panels because that will just 
add more weight to the garment and this is already going to be a hefty garment as it is. So we'll just stick with the bodice bits. I think I'm gonna treat these a little bit like a tailored jacket, which might make for some interesting structure in this. Finally, I'm cutting out a lining layer from this lightweight satin charmeuse, which seemed like a nice idea at the time, but in reality is never a nice idea ever. This stuff is like jelly and getting it to stay relatively on grain long enough to cut out is like wrestling eels. The most efficient way to manage this is to intermittently chant the following incantation. On second thought, this might not actually improve the behavior of the fabric, but it will at least keep you from defenestrating yourself in the process. With all fabric lining, interlining, and pocket pieces cut out, and any piecing stitched on to complete any original pattern pieces, I'm now preparing my outer panels by flatlining the horsehair shapes to the outer shapes. This is done first by basting these into place so that they don't shift around before I can stitch the pieces together. I'm also going ahead and stitching my pocket pieces to the correct position on the side front and side panels. These are then creased back to form the pocket openings. And since we're working with a velvet here, I'm doing all of my pressing onto a needleboard so that I don't crush the pile of the velvet fibers. Then I can pin all of the robe panels together. There are a total of nine panels in this robe, four on each side with a center back panel cut on the fold. But before I can go and stitch everything together, I'm first going through and basting all of my seams with a long running stitch, just to help keep everything into place. Because of the standing fibers on velvet, the fabric can shift ever so slightly when those fibers are flattened under the machine foot. So making sure everything is neatly lined up and unable to shift before putting it under the machine will help to make the machine sewing process a much calmer experience. With my separate robe and lining layers stitched together and the sleeves made up and ready to go, I'm taking a quick moment to add a strip of linen edge tape to the front edge of the robe, from the waist point up around the neck and down the other front edge to the opposite waist point. This is a little tailoring trick that will just help to stabilize that front edge, especially because I've got a little bit of a curved shape to that neck opening, so this will help that opening edge to stay nice and crisp and not stretch out of shape. At this point, I've put on the shell garment and figured out roughly the sleeve placement, so I'm just stitching these in now by hand with a back stitch so that they are nice and secure. Once that is complete, I can clip into the arm's eye seam allowance every inch or so to alleviate any curve strain. And now it is lining time. Yes, there are modern ways to do this, involving stitching the pieces inside out by machine all around and then turning them out right side out, but why do that when you can spend three times as long doing things the historical way by turning and felling for literally no reason beyond sheer personal enjoyment? The sleeve linings are done separately beginning from the cuff edge. 
I've decided to leave a circa three inch slit at the cuff just for funsies. I personally love sleeves that are long enough to cover the hands in the winter, so this way I can have my nice long sleeve paws without worrying about making them too tight to fit over the hands, and so that they can be easily rolled back if needed. And now for some finishing touches, mainly stitching the arms eye lining into place to complete the sleeves, turning in and stitching the hem, and finally attaching the closure piece. This is just a nice decorative little hook and eye closure piece that I found on Etsy and that I thought would add a nice bit of whimsical decoration. It's just stitched on at a couple of anchor points with some doubled silk thread for strength. And that concludes the making process for this robe. I think it certainly succeeds in the drama department. It has turned out every bit the wonderfully, perhaps a bit overdressed look that I will most certainly covet when I am pottering about the workroom on perhaps a less exciting day. Overcoats, dressing gowns, robes, what have you. I always maintain that these are some of the most important garments in a person's wardrobe because you can be wearing whatever you want underneath them, pajamas, underwear, old, perhaps less exciting, round the house wear. But as soon as you put on this very simple overgarment that theoretically takes just a second to put on, all of a sudden your entire look is just so much more elegant. There's nothing I love more than popping out for a croissant or something in my pajamas on a Sunday morning, putting on my nice, long, elegant Victorian overcoat, and all of a sudden everyone thinks you've just come from the opera at eight o'clock in the morning for some reason. But nevertheless, the sentiment stands because you can, at your core, be nice and comfy in your pajamas, but you can also bask in the glory that you know you look fabulous. I mean, I'm sure you look fabulous in your pajamas also, but you can look even more fabulous in a very long, flowy velvet robe too. What is not to love? I highly encourage trying this out for yourself. I had an excellent time doing this. I suppose I have nothing further to add other than go forth and live your most unnecessarily, but very necessarily dramatic existence. Oh good, it's you. You must be here to discuss the acquisition of NordVPN to assist you on your internet stealth mission. Well, you have come to the right place. NordVPN is the fastest virtual private network service designed to help you navigate the treacherous interwebs a bit more safely. Wearing 12 layers of clothing in an encrypted Network tunnel. Everything's absolutely under control. By masking your IP address in an encrypted network tunnel, NordVPN prevents websites, internet service providers, and data harvesters from being able to collect your identifying data and potentially peek at sensitive information like passwords. More excitingly, a masked IP address means that geo-blocking sites won't be able to restrict access to content based on your geographic location. With the click of a button in their interactive map, you can be exploring all the geo-restricted Netflix in the US, Brazil, South Korea, or any of the over 50 different countries NordVPN has the option to choose from. Get the exclusive NordVPN deal at nordvpn.com slash Bernadette. It is risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Who's she? We don't know her. She's in VPN of the 21st century.